Hello, my name is Amy Oxentenko. I'm a consultant in the Division of Gastroenterology and Hepatology at Bale Clinic Rochester. Today I'm going to be talking about three clinical pearls in gastroenterology and tell you about the salient features of these cases. The first case that I want to discuss is a 48-year-old gentleman who was found to have abnormal liver tests when he presented for an insurance examination. During the course of his workup, he was found to have infection with hepatitis C without features of cirrhosis. He was also found to not be immunologically immune to hepatitis A or B. The clinical pearl in this case is that all patients with chronic liver disease with or without cirrhosis should be offered vaccinations for hepatitis A and hepatitis B unless they're actively infected or serologically immune to either virus. This clinical practice came into play in 2009 when the Advisory Committee on Immunization Practices recommended that all patients with chronic liver disease, again with or without cirrhosis, be recommended to have vaccinations for hepatitis A and hepatitis B unless they have active infection or are serologically immune. The importance of this is that you may have a patient with chronic, stable, well-compensated liver disease who can have severe acute decompensation if they're actively and acutely infected with hepatitis A or hepatitis B, both of which are preventable with a vaccination series. Therefore, in all of your patients that you see with chronic liver disease, you should check their immunity status to hepatitis A and B, and if they're not serologically immune to, to both of them, vaccination should be offered. The advisory committee also recommends that in this patient population that yearly influenza vaccine as well as a pneumococcal vaccine be considered barring any contraindications to these vaccinations. Next case that I'd like to discuss is a 41-year-old female who had new onset of abdominal bloating and discomfort in the baseline setting of dysmenorrhea and constipation. During her evaluation, she was found to have iron deficiency anemia and a negative tissue transglutaminase antibody. She'd had a prior colonoscopy within the last year that was deemed to be normal. The clinical pearl in this case is that iron deficiency anemia is the most common extraintestinal manifestation of celiac disease. And therefore, all patients who present with iron deficiency anemia need to have small bowel biopsies done to exclude celiac disease, even in the presence of negative serologic studies. Clinically, iron deficiency anemia may be seen in up to 50% of patients with newly diagnosed celiac disease, and in fact, may be the sole manifestation of celiac disease in these patients. Therefore, it behooves you in any patient that you're sending for an endoscopy for the indication of iron deficiency anemia that they have small bowel biopsies done to exclude celiac disease. This is, is, should be the case even with negative serologic studies because none of the serologic tests that we have for celiac disease are 100% sensitive. If a patient undergoes a, an endoscopic evaluation and other abnormalities are found, such as erosions or vascular ectasias, these findings should not preclude obtaining small bowel biopsies if that patient truly has iron deficiency anemia, as up to one-third of patients with celiac disease ha will have one of these other endoscopic abnormalities, again, should not preclude small bowel biopsies in that patient population. The next case that I want to discuss is a 28-year-old male with years of intermittent attacks of nausea and vomiting. He's had a thorough evaluation to date, which has largely been negative. One feature that he reports with his symptoms is that taking a bath or shower in very hot water has tremendous relief uh, for his nausea. He reports a five-year history of daily marijuana use. The clinical pearl in this case is that cyclical attacks of nausea and vomiting have been reported in those who are chronic users of marijuana, a condition known as cannabinoid hyperemesis syndrome. Bathing in hot water with therapeutic relief is very characteristic of this syndrome. Clinically speaking, we know that cannabinoid hyperemesis syndrome seems like a very paradoxical phenomenon. We all know that marijuana and its metabolite, delta-9 tetrahydrocannabinol, or THC, is a very powerful antiemetic. Therefore, it seems unusual that daily marijuana use could cause this type of syndrome. However, we know in chronic users of marijuana, there may be a buildup of the metabolite, and in this case, the metabolite has a very long half-life and is lipophilic, meaning it combines cerebral fat and may affect the hypothalamic and limbic system. 
These patients may report a chronic history of intense cyclical nausea or vomiting, but they may feel very well in between attacks. In the literature, there are a number of case reports of patients who will report this in tremendous relief of their symptoms with hot water, either with showers or bathing. And in fact, there are patients who have either scalded their skin or exhausted hot water supplies because of this tremendous relief they will receive. While bathing in hot water is not a sensitive or specific finding for this condition, it's very characteristic. If patients stop the daily use of their marijuana, it will result in cessation of the cannabinoid hyperemesis syndrome. We hope you benefited from this presentation based on the content of Mayo Clinic Proceedings. Our journal's mission is to promote the best interests of patients by advancing the knowledge and professionalism of the physician community. If you're interested in more information about Mayo Clinic Proceedings, visit our website at www.mayoclinicproceedings.org. There you will find additional videos on our YouTube channel, and you can follow us on Twitter. For more information on healthcare at Mayo Clinic, please visit www.mayoclinic.org. This video content is copyrighted by Mayo Foundation for Medical Education and Research.